Let's get coffee sometime. Famous last words, right? Some of you probably just said that to somebody here. Like, hey, we should get coffee sometime. Sounds like an easy way to break the ice. But we all know that without a plan, there's no coffee to be had, right? Um, now, I'm not trying to make this like a pickup line, although it was like that in my life. When, I remember one time I, I met my wife. I don't know if you guys know my story. I'm married to Tabitha. I love her very much. We've been married 14 years. Uh, but I met her five years before we went on our first date. I saw her at church, which is a great place to meet somebody, by the way. And uh, it was like, wow, who is that? So I asked her friend, uh, Amy, and I said, hey, Amy, like, is your friend dating anybody? Because I wanted to make sure that it wasn't going to get weird, right? And she's like, no, she's not dating anybody. So I said, well, could I ask her out, you think? And so she said, well, let me ask. Let me do a little recon for you. So she went and asked Tabitha if she'd be interested in going on a date with me. And I found out some bad news. She said, no, she's not dating anybody right now. She's on a break from dating. And she does not want to go out with you. So I was like, ugh. No life. Five years go by. Five years go by. We start uh, talking again at the time. Uh, MySpace was still a thing. Some of you guys don't know what that is. It was like a worse version of Facebook. Um, but it had some cool hacks. And you had music or whatever. And we started like messaging each other on MySpace. One day after church, I got up the courage to say, hey, we should do coffee sometime. And then I did the next thing that you need to do if you really want to have coffee with somebody, whether it's you know, on a date or just as a friend, so you have to have a plan. Because intention without action means nothing, right? So I was like, literally in front of another guy who was about to ask her out, because it gets crazy out there. I was like, hey, if we should do coffee, what's your number? And she gave me her number, and we went out on our very first date. And let me just tell you, after five years, I wish I could tell you that I like, nailed it, but I went to the wrong coffee shop. So uh, the Lord intervened. I was like, where are you? She's like, I'm in the, uh, the coffee shop on Germantown Road. I said, I'm also at the coffee shop on Germantown Road. We were just at different coffee shops on Germantown Road in Memphis. Turns out there were four different coffee shops on Germantown Road. We just picked the wrong ones. Uh, but I'm here to say that God still works, right? He still makes things happen. And I am so glad that I actually took a step of faith and not only had the right ideas, but also had the right action. And we're going to talk about faith tonight because a lot of us have missed perceptions about faith, and we think that faith is simply uh, a feeling that we have. Or we think that faith should be uh, information, like faith is a fact. We should know certain things. If we have the right information, then we're going to know how to uh, operate well or please God. But faith is something deeper. Faith is belief plus action. And I have a little, like, uh, uh, algorithm here for you. Faith is action plus belief. Now, I don't know why I did like a math equation because I am terrible at math. In fact, I stopped doing math when I was in college. I took my first calculus class. I said, nope. And I dropped it and took consumer math right after that. I was like, I think I'm just going to be doing like something in English instead. But I believe that this is true. And if we get this right, we will find our faith unlock. And that's what I want to do tonight as we look at the scriptures. Why don't you turn with me in the scriptures to Mark chapter 2. Mark 2. We're going to read a story that many of you have heard before. But I want to tell it in a way that will unlock faith for you in new and significant ways. So I'm going to read the text and we'll unpack it, okay? So Mark 2, starting in verse 1. It says this. When he entered Capernaum again after some days, it was reported that he was at home. So the he here is Jesus. So when Jesus came to Capernaum, people found out that he was home. I don't know if this is his home. The Bible's not specific. Or it's the place he's staying. Uh, there are archaeological digs in Capernaum. I've been there. Where you can go see the site where this probably happened. There's a, a house. It's ruins. Like there's no roof on it anymore. Or any other of the other houses. But like it's a stone foundation. And around it, there's a church foundation that's built to signify that something significant happened there, which is probably where this story 
takes place. So we don't know if it's Jesus' house or Peter's house or one of the other disciples' homes, but it says that he was at home. Verse 2, so many people gathered together that there was no more room, not even in the doorway, and he was speaking the word to them. They came to him bringing a paralytic carried by four of them. Since they were not able to bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him, and after digging through it, they lowered the mat on which the paralytic was lying. Seeing their faith, Jesus told the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. So Jesus is preaching. Some friends have a man who is paralyzed. They bring him to Jesus. They can't get in. So they take the roof off and then lower him to Jesus. And Jesus tells him his, son, his sins are forgiven. Verse 6. But some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does he speak like this? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? It's good to see that the haters are still real even in the first century, right? They're like, what? Like, you, you say that his sins are forgiven, that can't happen. Verse 8, right away Jesus perceived in his spirit that they were thinking like this within themselves and said to them, why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he told the paralytic, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Immediately he got up, took the mat, and went out in front of everyone. As a result, <clears throat> they were all astounded and gave glory to God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. Now, crazy story, right? You see these men bring their friend to Jesus. Jesus tells them his sins are forgiven. Then people are like, what? How can that possibly be? Jesus says, stand up and walk, and he does. And here we find faith being exhibited by everybody in this story except for the scribes. And I want us just to look at these two specific groupings, the friends and then the man, as we look at what it means to live by faith. Because they all have belief plus action. In their life. So the friends, I want us to look at them first. <coughs> These four friends hear that Jesus is home and they decide to bring their paralytic friend. And we don't know much about them. In fact, they never show up again in the Bible. We don't know like where they heard about Jesus. We don't know how they know that he can heal people. Maybe they saw him heal somebody. Maybe a rumor got out. We know that he's healed some lepers. We know that he's changed water into wine. But we don't have any context that Jesus could ever have healed someone who's paralyzed. So they bring this man to Jesus, and it's a risk because many people in Jesus' day thought that if you had some kind of physical malady, like whether you're blind or, or deaf or you couldn't walk, it was because you sinned. So they would specifically say, I'm like this because my parents sinned or I sinned or I'm going to sin someday. God's punishing me for this. And yet they are so desperate to get this man to Jesus that they will not stop. They will not be turned aside. They climb on top of the roof and they rip the roof off and drop him. Now, <clears throat> at one point, I was a, a lifeguard. Any lifeguards in the house? Like two or three of us? Or then you know that lifeguarding is like the most boring job ever. Like it's like... You think it's like Baywatch or something cool. Everybody's like, yeah, they're like awesome. And they get to do like cool saves. Most of the time, you are bored out of your mind, right? There's some moments of terror, but mostly it's just boredom. But when I was lifeguarding, uh, we did this drill because they do train you to, to try to save lives, which is a whole other thing. Like they're training like 18-year-olds to save people's lives in water that they can't see. But anyway, they did this like training program and uh, they used me as a real life like uh, example. And so I was serving at a summer camp in North Platte, Nebraska, and someone got the great idea uh, in the middle of like a, a winter thaw, so everything was still pretty cold. They said, you know what, Mike, it'd be great to pretend that you like got like in a bad boating accident. So we want you to go take a paddle boat, of all things, out to the middle of the lake and then just jump off and wait for us to come rescue you. And you're going to pretend that you are like paralyzed, okay? So I jump into the water and I wait 15 minutes and no one's coming. I'm like, seriously, guys, okay? Finally, the boat comes. They get me out. And you know what they do? They strap me to a backboard. You guys know what that is? 
It's like one of those boards where they like completely immobilize you. They strap me down. I'm soaking wet. I'm getting hypothermia. I start seeing lights. Like, it's like everything starts getting really dim. I get really cold. Why? Because they want to take care of my spine. That's what you do with people who might have a back injury. What do these guys do? We're going to rip the roof off. We're going to lower you to Jesus. Like they have no fear. Why? Because they know that if they can just get him to Jesus, Jesus will do something. That's why Jesus says that he sees their faith. They're willing to do whatever it takes. They're not just intellectually thinking, hey, Jesus can do something. They're saying, I'm going to actually do whatever it takes to bring my friend to Jesus. And honestly, guys, I'm just going to put myself out there. I think I do a terrible job of living like this. I don't know why. I don't know why. I, I think I hope that my friends will see my Instagram feed and that will be enough. Or that they'll like, you know, they'll be like, oh, he's like doing this talk about Jesus. Or like, you know, that they'll passively come across it. But I don't really live like this where I am so desperate to bring people to Jesus knowing their need. Because all of us need Jesus. And so there's not an alignment in my life when it comes to like what I know about God, my, my belief, and then my action. And I'm not trying to, trying to put any shame on anybody, but I just think that if we want to be people who see Jesus actually do stuff, then there needs to be some action on our part. That's one of the reasons why we wanted to do this breakthrough night next week. It was the weirdest thing. Like we were in a, uh, like, creative planning meeting and I was just kind of sharing this kind of like thought that was on my heart. I was like, you know, there's this word, I'm thinking about it, but like I kind of feel like it's, it might give people like weird them out, but I just feel like the Lord wants to do something at Kairos. I feel like a lot of us are carrying like burdens and we're, we're feeling the woundedness maybe of church hurt or we're feeling the woundedness of like our parents hurt or we're, we're be, dealing with like depression or we're dealing with anxiety or we're like just deeply alone. And we've been asking God to move. I don't know if you've got something like that. I've got a, like a laundry list of things that I'm praying for. And, and I, I think that sometimes we can feel very alone, but community kills loneliness. So like what if we did this as a community and we just said, God, let's just bring these to Jesus. And I was thinking about this word, and Cade goes, I know the word. Because like Katie and I have like this weird like mind meld thing. I don't know if you guys, Kate Thompson, our worship leader, uh, he and I, for some reason, like we, we like have this weird like Vulcan mind meld thing going. And he was like, I know the word. And I said, what is it? He said, breakthrough. I said, you're right. It is. It is. It's breakthrough. And then Stephanie Athanasio, who's also on our team. I'm sorry, Stephanie Prince. That's her name now. Prince. She's got married. Uh, Stephanie Prince. She actually said, you know what? And her eyes got really big. The Lord put a word on my heart yesterday in my quiet time. And she like turned over her journal and said, breakthrough. And we were like, okay, creepy, right? <laughs> maybe, maybe, just maybe Jesus is trying to tell us something. And we said, you know what? It would be cool for us just to like slow down and, and just let God move. And so I... I just want to put this out there. This was actually not in my notes, but I just want to put this out there before you. If we want to like apply this passage and not just be about a story about a man who lived a long time ago and his friends took him to Jesus, maybe you have an opportunity to bring somebody next week that needs Jesus. That just needs Jesus. And, and you're not like trying to guilt them. It's maybe, maybe it's the most far from Jesus person you know, but maybe it's somebody who's just like feeling alone. And you're like, man, listen, just come with me. Let's just pray. Because I think God wants to do something in your life. And I want to have a front row seat to see what God can do. So that's us next week. Second person I want us to look at is this man. So if you guys look with me in the scriptures, um, Jesus says this uh, to him. If you look with me in verse 10, I want to just kind of unpack this here. He says, but so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he told the paralytic. I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Now, this guy had been brought to Jesus, like many of us have been brought to church. 
I, I'm guessing in this room there's a pretty wide swath of people. Like some of us have never been to church at all, but you're here. So somebody brought you or you came in or just felt like you wanted to come. But there's others of us like me who like your parents were always at church. Okay. Like, like my parents um, were always at church and it was the worst because my dad was the pastor. So we always had to be the first ones there and the last ones to leave. And they'd always talk to people. And I just remember as a kid just going, dad, can you get us out of here? Like, just like, can we go to lunch? And my kids do the same thing to me now, right? And my kids like hate going to church with me because I just talk to everybody. But this man is finally in front of Jesus. And he has to make a decision because Jesus calls him to something more than simply being in front of him. He calls him to take a step of action. And he asks him to stand up and take his mat and walk. So... I think it's important for us to see, like, Jesus calls him to take action, not simply heals him. The man has to respond in faith for the healing to happen. Do you see the difference there? Like, Jesus doesn't just go, boom, and the guy just pops up by himself. Jesus says, for you to experience this healing, I need you to get up and take your mat and get out. And I think many of us, are unwilling to do that because we're not really sure if Jesus has the authority to do it. And I think everybody else was wondering what Jesus was up to too because they don't know if he has the authority. In fact, Jesus speaks for everybody else because people are, are thinking in their mind, who is Jesus to forgive sins? Up to this point, Jesus has never done that. When Jesus says, your sins are forgiven to this man, no one had ever said anything like that. To anybody in the Jewish faith, at least somebody who's reputable. So Jesus goes out into completely uncharted waters when he says, man, your sins are forgiven. And Jesus knows that the, the scribes, the religious leaders are getting uptight and frustrated with him when he says this. And the question that Jesus asks then is says, okay, I said your sins are forgiven, but which is more difficult to say that or to heal him, to say stand up and walk. And a lot of times when we hear this, or at least when I've read it, I go, man, you know, I guess it is easier to say your sins are forgiven and not stand up and walk. But what if the opposite is true? What if it's much easier to be healed and to be able to walk again than it is to, to have your sins forgiven? You see... There are other people who had their bodies healed by Jesus and by the disciples. You can get your body healed by medicine. But you have to have your soul healed. My pastor told me a story about a man who um, was a major cause for, uh, for like a missionary movement. He lived in Brazil. He had... Um, a problem with his legs, which made him paralyzed and he couldn't walk. So people raised money here in America to pay for his surgeries. And there was a massive like drive for this. And so people were giving money. Eventually he was healed and was able to walk. But today is serving a double life sentence in prison in Brazil. Because even though his body was healed, his soul still hadn't received healing. One of my greatest fears for us is that we want what God can do for us rather than what he wants to do in us. And I believe that one of the things that's important for us as believers is to not just be people who ask God for external healing or for external signs, but to have an inward reality. The greater sign is a changed life. And when you read this, sometimes you may go like, God, do you still do stuff like this? The answer is yes. Over and over and over again, I see people at Kairos who experience tremendous transformation because Jesus has changed their life. But it always comes at a cost. The cost is saying, I will respond to what Jesus wants me to do. You see, this man had a mat. It was all he knew. He laid upon it. He slept on it. He lived on the mat. That was his life. And Jesus said, I want you to get up off that mat and I want you to walk out. I want you to get up and leave that old life behind and I want you to follow me. And here's the deal. You cannot manage the mat that you may be on. We all have a mat. 
You cannot manage it. You cannot try to control it. You simply must give it to Jesus. And tonight, what I want to do in the last little bit that we have here is I just want to speak to the simple reality is that all of us are like this man. We all have something that is deeply painful in our life that is keeping us from living the life that Jesus wants us to live, following him with all of our life. And Jesus is asking us to trust him with it. That might be your singleness or your marriage. So some of us think like, hey, when you get married, you, all your problems go away. Let me just tell you, they just get more complicated, okay? <laughs> My guy. <laughs> now you like got to figure out like not just one sinful person, but two, okay? And you might just be in a place where you're like, My marriage, man, I just need Jesus. Some of us who are single in this room, a lot of us in this room are single. Man, you're just like, God, can I just get married? Can I get married? Can I find the one? And God might be saying, listen, my goodness to you is to wait until the right person is there. That was my story. I told you guys that when Tabitha and I first met, like, that was five years almost to the day before we actually went on our first date. And I am so glad because both of us were train wrecks. <laughs> I don't know if we would have gotten married if we'd actually started dating. You might know the person that you may marry. You just don't know that yet. So maybe God wants you to trust him with that. That might be your mat. On a more serious note, that thing that God may want from you might be something that you are numbing out with, whether that's too much television, or social media, or pornography. You're leaning on it rather than leaning on Jesus. And Jesus says, listen, I have so much more for you than that. Trust me with it. Get up and walk. For still others, there may be a season that you're right now that you're wrestling with. When I talked about loneliness, you're like, man, I'm right there. If you cannot leave loneliness behind, it comes with you until you find community. But you can take a first step in the community tonight. By saying, I want to be a part of this family at Kairos. And the easiest way you can do that is by meeting one of our leaders here after the service. There's some of us right up front. There's some of us in the room as you leave at the Welcome Center. Just come up and say, listen, I want to get plugged in. One of the easiest ways you can follow Christ is by following Christ with other people. But tonight, as I was talking about what your mat is, whatever that is, you probably already know what it is. Like God just revealed it to you. you. You intuitively know what Jesus wants you to leave behind, that he wants you to get up off of and walk out. And I don't know what it is, but you do. So I want you to write that down tonight. Maybe just open up a, a note on your phone or write it down on your hand if you want to or write it on a piece of paper. But you do need to deal with it. Because Jesus will not call you to the next step of obedience until you deal with the first one. For some of you, it's simply giving up control and trusting Jesus with your life. And you've been in front of Jesus. You've sung in front of churches. You've gone to Bible studies or VBS or camp. But your life is not truly his. And he wants it. So don't leave before giving it to him. But that's our question tonight. We're going to close with 120 seconds. 120 seconds is simply a time of reflection where we just go, okay, the message has been taught. Now I'm going to sit in it. The question is, what is your mat? What is it? And will you trust God with it? Let me pray for us. Jesus, we ask that in this moment of reflection that you would be present and powerful. God, I pray that you would speak in ways beyond what I can say that you would just press in upon us and give us just a measure of your incredible affection. But God, I pray that we would not stay laying down, waiting for you to move when you've called us to get up and walk. We pray that in your name, Jesus.